All right, welcome everyone. Uh, sounds like the sound is working and we're ready to get going. Uh, this is going to be a, a grilling session at my friend here, Peter. No. Uh, it's going to be a friendly conversation, my friend here, Peter. Uh, but before we begin, uh, why don't we start off with uh, a land acknowledgement. Uh, the San Francisco Environment Department acknowledges that we occupy the unceded ancestral homeland of the Remita Shaloni peoples, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. We recognize that the Remita Shaloni understand the interconnectedness of all things and that maintain harmony with nature for millennia. We honor the Remita Shaloni peoples for their enduring commitment to Mother Earth as the indigenous protectors of this land. And in accordance with their traditions, the Remita Shaloni have never ceded lost nor forgotten their responsibilities as the caretakers of this place, as well as all for all people who reside in their traditional territory. We recognize that we benefit from living and working on their traditional homeland. As uninvited guests, we affirm their sovereign rights as first peoples, and we wish to pay respect to the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramachish community. We recognize to respectfully honor the Ramachish people, we must embrace and collaborate meaningfully to record indigenous knowledge in how we care for San Francisco and for all its people. And so with that, uh, that's almost a, a perfect segue into the great conversation we're gonna have today uh, with Peter Bratt. Um, really excited to have Peter. Uh, Peter and I have been working together for, for quite some time on an exciting project here in San Francisco. Uh, that we're going to share with everyone. But just to even just back up on the purpose of, of this chat and to, to frame the reason why we do these electric fireside chats, um, it's really just to highlight kind of local heroes and leaders and people that are doing amazing environmental work right here in San Francisco. Oftentimes we, we find ourselves kind of looking outside of the city seeing, oh, where are the, what, what are people doing outside of the city? when right here in our hometown, in our backyard, we have amazing individuals here in community, working in government and the nonprofit sector all over um, that are helping to lead the cause of environmental stewardship. And so today we're gonna uh, meet Peter. Uh, so I have to read Peter's bio because there's a very extensive bio and some of this stuff I didn't even know until I read, read the bio, which is gonna be really exciting. <laughs> uh, so Peter uh, is a Rockefeller Fellow, a Peabody Award winner, an Emmy-nominated film producer, writer, director, and the recipient of the University of, San of California Santa Cruz 2023 Social Science Alumni of the Year Award. Raised by a strong indigenous single mother from Peru, his family was part of the Indians of all tribes occupation of Alcatraz, the Wounded Knee standoff, Northwest fishing rights struggle, and the farm workers movement. His longstanding commitment to increasing visibility of indigenous peoples, community engagement, and policy change is reflected in this film work, as well as his 28 years of leadership at the Friendship House Association of American Indians, an indigenous-led nonprofit that provides vital social services to thousands of Native Americans living in and throughout San Francisco Bay Area and beyond. So with that, uh, we can give a round of applause to Peter Bratt. You know, uh, we started off with the, the land acknowledgement, which is um, a very appropriate thing and something that we've made a city policy for, for San Francisco and when we do kind of events. When you hear those words, what, what does it mean kind of to you and in, in kind of reflecting on those words? Um, I, I think acknowledgement, you know, as French Pass is, uh, is an inpatient substance uh, treatment center. We serve natives from from throughout the uh, country and the state. And when relatives come uh, to begin their recovery journey, the first step towards healing is acknowledgement. So a land acknowledgement, I think, is the first step. Um, it's great to honor and recognize uh, the, the home guard, the tribe who originally inhabited this territory. Um, but I think there are other, are there other steps to bring us into full reconciliation and healing. Um, and so it has to go beyond recognition. It has to go beyond honoring. And it, it actually involves returning uh, physical land. Um, uh, we are, Friendship House works with uh, the Association of Romitish Ohlone, 
um, who I think helped author that acknowledgement for the city. Mm-hmm. And I know my brothers over there, you know, they're, they get umpteen requests to begin board meetings, commission meetings, mm-hmm. other convenings throughout the city, both in the, in the private and public sector. And at this point, they can't they can't do it anymore. And and one of the things it's it's been it's been happening for a little while. And I hope it doesn't just become lip service. And just another uh, thing to get out of the way so we get to the agenda. And sometimes I feel it it, it approaches that. Um, and then oftentimes uh, within our own community, I know that uh, other leaders for other native nonprofits are always getting requests. And and these are folks who have full time, you know, nine to five jobs, and oftentimes take time off without pay to go do a land acknowledgement. And I think, I think a lot of uh, communities who ask natives to go do that don't realize that, and think, hey, we're doing you a favor, come and give the land acknowledge, take two hours after your day. And and I think folks could hit burnout, and sometimes resentment sets in. So I think it's I think it's a great first step. Towards uh, towards healing and reconciliation, but it has to go a lot further than that. That's that's really powerful and well said. And just remembering when we make these requests, right, whether it's government or anyone else of individuals, like acknowledging how, who those individuals are, and, you know, what they're doing in their own lives, right, and and kind of honoring the fact that they're taking time out of their their day, their work schedule, their livelihood. To come and celebrate their their own ancestry and to pay homage to that, and also to bring light to yeah. kind of the work that needs to be done. That that's that's really powerful. And I think maybe the second part of that, where where I think you were going, was maybe not just the words, right? Which are words on a page. The acknowledgement uh, is a first step. How do you think we turn that into action? You said about returning land uh, back to the people. Yeah, I mean, the, as as probably many of you know, there there is a, a land back movement uh, just across the bay in uh, in Oakland, Emeryville. Our sisters over there, uh, Karina Gould and um, Janella, were with the the leaders of the Segorte uh, Land Trust. Uh, were just returned land by the city of Oakland, and then recently got a, an incredible uh, donation to help um, uh, get their uh, the oldest shell mound in their territory back. Um, it, a huge breakthrough, um, but a long, many years uh, battle and challenge, I know, for, for my sister to get to that point and, and met with a lot of resistance. Um, and that, I think that's a very difficult thing for um, the dominant culture to, to to confront you know this idea of of returning something um that might right now might be utilized for for another purpose you might be extracting resources from it you might be you know renting a house or it might be a beautiful parkway or or or, or, or what have you and so we it's it's very hard to give something up um i know that's a conversation that's happening here in san francisco uh, with our with our, our relatives from the Ruma Um but I, I still think uh, the city's had a difficult time to reach that point to uh, actually take action in return, you know, to go beyond the honoring and acknowledgement. And and there's a word in there uh, that really stands out to me, you know, the, the unceded territory. What does that mean, unceded? It means the, you know, Europeans, first the Spaniards, then the Mexican government, and then the U.S. government, these nation states came and, and tried to take by force these territories and met with resistance. And, uh, and that resistance still is in place. They never gave up their, their claim to this territory or the responsibilities that go with it. And so in, in the indigenous mind, you know, they, these territories still are under the stewardship of indigenous communities, which goes back millennia. Where do you think some of those barriers kind of like come from, like in a city as as progressive as we like to call ourselves in San Francisco and to see kind of what's happened in Oakland? What do you think some of those barriers uh, that you've experienced might be? Uh, I mean, I could I could I could just speak from as somebody who's been part of a 
um, a really essential social service agency that's led and it's by and for uh, American Indians, Friendship House Association of American Indians. We turned 60 this year. The oldest and largest social service agency in the country. Out of there, and that, it goes back to our founder, Helen Wakazu, um, yeah. from the Navajo Nation, who founded Friendship House. But um, most folks don't realize that the majority of Indian people today live in cities like San Francisco, and that's that's partly the result of a federal policy to uh, terminate and assimilate Native people. Um, by relocating them to cities in the 50s. You know, Indian people were, were removed from their territories and sent to cities, some of them for the very first time, the majority of them, and uh, and uh, were supposed to become white people. But that didn't happen. You know, it was the 60s were happening. The Black Panthers were organizing across the Bay. You know, San Francisco State students, uh, you know, protested. And, and from that protest, resistance movement created the first ethnic studies program in the country. Um, the farm workers movement were they you know started marching the civil rights movement was happening and uh, and so rather than becoming uh, you know white people uh, native young native people organized um, and and really created visibility but but by and large today uh, I, I feel like particularly urban natives remain invisible and underserved even in San Francisco uh, you know, we get we get responses from from civic leaders here in the, in the city. That, well, I didn't know there were Indians here. And it's 2024. Um, so I think one of the one of the biggest obstacles is invisibility. Um, and we talked about your your kind of own upbringing, but what was it about kind of your experience growing up that led you to like? to really focus on, on all the work that you're doing today and, and continuing this this fight? Um, so I, I come from uh, uh, indigenous, my mother's indigenous. She's from the Quechua people in, in Peru. She came here as a teenager. Uh, my great grandmother uh, was brought by a wealthy American family um, as a domestic and, uh, and brought my mother with her. And then my father uh, was uh, 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 Anglo-American, went to Balboa High School, Ooh. locals out there. <laughs> and, and, uh, Balboa High School, <laughs> here. And, uh, and I would say that the early part of my life, uh, I was confused. It, you know, uh, at the age of seven, at the age of six, my parents divorced. And um, and my mom was thinking of, of returning back to her homeland with her five children. And just at that time, uh, a young Mohawk leader, she, you know, she turned on the television. Here's, uh, you know, on KRON, uh, Richard Oaks um, calling Indians of all tribes to come out to Alcatraz um, to occupy uh, the island and send a message to to the government about its treatment of, of native people at that time. And so my mom packed uh, all five of us up and, and we moved to the island. And it was really out of that experience that I slowly, you know, became grounded in an indigenous identity um, and became, you know, became a movement child that, you know, after the occupation, you know, uh, my mom became very involved with the Mundini standoff and the fishing rights struggle up in the Northwest. And so, you know, my brothers and sisters and I, we lived in the back of a station wagon. There were no seatbelt laws back then. <laughs> so <laughs> put the seats down and mattresses and, uh, you know, sleep on the side of the road when, when we got tired. But, uh, you know, for, for years, we, we, we were movement people. Um, and that really, I think, grounded all of us uh, with a uh, cultural identity. Um, that is with us today, you know. Um, so being part of that community, and there are certain, you know, there are certain principles and values that really hold a community together, and and that was kind of the 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 milieu that we grew up in, and that was, and that's very reflective of, of what existed here in the Bay Area. It was an intertribal, uh, indigenous community, oftentimes indigenous and interracial, 
Um, there were so many collaborations that young Native leaders uh, were forging with, you know, the Black Power movement, the leaders of the uh, of the Black Panther movement, um, other allies, you know, the peace movement, the anti-war movement that was happening at that time. It was also the is Earth Week. You know, that was the first. You know, that was just that was just starting as well. The women's movement. Um, so there were incredible collaborations in San Francisco. I think was was a nexus. Uh, for the nation, um, and so you know, we kind of grew in that, grew up in that, and that really, I think, instilled an identity that 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 informs a lot of the work and engagement that not just me, but my brothers and sisters are a part of today. When, when did you kind of like call San Francisco home? I mean, it sounds like you were maybe moving around a lot as you're going and working on on different issues in different parts of the country. Like, when did San Francisco kind of become home to you? Uh, I mean, San Francisco has always been home. I was born and raised here. You know, born on uh, Divisadero and Gary, the old, you know, the old Kaiser. Um, and you know, I, I was a kid, so you know, hey, you're involved in the, you know, the indigenous self determination struggle. Like, I didn't know what the hell that. that meant, you know? <laughs> I uh, we were children that were just packed up, and and just followed my mother. My mother was an activist servant leader. Um, she was also an RN. So oftentimes when we would go to these resistance camps, she would set up, uh, you know, first aid stations um, for relatives, uh, you know, who would come from all over. You know, there were there were young natives coming from Canada, from all throughout the United States, you know, from south of the border. Um, so as a child, you know, it was, it was just a very exciting uh, time to to be alive and it was it was sort of certain freedom you know it was the hell of a lot of school <laughs> <laughs> um for good causes <laughs> uh, but you know surrounded by you know leaders like richard oaks and, and john trudell and um wilma mankiller and you know betty cooper i, I mean helen wakazu the woman who eventually she adopted me as her son and um and brought me into friendship the friendship house work there were just so many phenomenal uh, individuals, extraordinary individuals and leaders who are not written about in the history books, but within the community, just so impactful. And those those were our role, our role models. I mean, your mother sounds like an, an amazing person. And as far as the values she, she definitely instilled in you, as far as the work that you're doing, but maybe even just talking about, about Helen and kind of how you got connected to Friendship House and, and Helen's work in, in starting that. Right. Uh, my, um, my involvement with Friendship House really kind of started with my own sobriety journey. Um, I celebrated 31 years of sobriety, uh, this year. And, uh, I'd say my kids have never seen me inebriated or high, you know, uh, which is really uh, important to me and significant. Um, but I was, you know, I was a lost young man. And um, I had, you know, in the community, there are always uh, spiritual leaders. I turned to a, a, a spiritual leader in the community and told him I was lost. And, uh, and he helped me, uh, you know, get on what we call the, the good red road. And so I replaced some of my uh, unhealthy habits with healthier spiritual habits. And that work led me to start volunteering at Friendship House. Around how, how old were you around that? Around I was that? in my uh, in my mid to late twenties, and I st and Helen, uh, you know, put me to work right away. And the volunteer work just it grew and grew. And I um, yeah. I always feel like you know the relatives who are going through recovery are that's my tribe. <laughs> you know, they're always re uh, real. Uh, and honest, um, yeah, and so that volunteer work eventually, uh, you know, became I became a board member. I served on the board for a long time, and then uh, um, more recently, you know, Helen asked me to become a, a, a staff to to lead this next phase of, of the Friendship House journey. And as I mentioned, uh, Friendship House is a, is a treatment program, but Helen had always envisioned that it would grow into a full service agency. 
um, that would even provide housing for elders, um, uh, youth programs, elder programs, retirement homes, farms, uh, uh, revillaging right here in the urban center. That was always her vision. And so uh, the vacant lot became available for sale. And um, and so she asked me to come on board. I told her I would give her, <laughs> her like one year. Uh, and it's, it's going on uh, almost five years. Five years. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we're gonna have you to see die. these bags, folks. <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of great progress and work. Yeah. And maybe we can just even talk about the work that you're you're doing right now and kind of set that up for the Village SF and kind of fulfilling mm -hmm. Helen's vision for the expansion of services through the Friendship House model. And so why don't you walk us through and, and let us know what you've been up to the last five years. Great. Um, so the vacant lot, uh, Friendship House purchased the lot next door and um, we're in the middle of, uh, of building six stories of uh, social services and cultural services. So uh, next door we'll have uh, medical, dental, behavioral health. We're gonna have a treatment program for young native mothers um, to go through uh, recovery with their small kids. There'll be an elder center, uh, a digital arts youth program center. There'll be a, a subterranean basketball court for the youth. Um, there'll be a gathering social hall for ceremonies, ceremonials and other socials. And there'll be also be a, a, a floor for um, supportive housing for graduates of the recovery program who oftentimes need, um, you know, supports as they make the transition um, out of recovery. Um, and then something that uh, that Tyrone and I have been collaborating on, we also envision um, uh, greening the at first the two blocks in front of Friendship House uh, with tree planting, parklets, slow streets, but that incubating a much larger vision uh, throughout the Mission Corridor. So we're working closely with the American Indian Cultural District, as well as the Latino Cultural District and um, and partnering with the city, which is which has really been really exciting and and I think innovative. Mm -hmm. And then also uh, we're in early um, development on um, on stewarding 3.8 acres uh, here in the city, working with Rec and Parks, the uh, uh, Rumatusha Loney, mm -hmm as well as the Cultural Conservancy to have a, a an indigenous urban uh, garden where we can grow food, traditional medicines, but more than anything else, have a, a ceremonial cultural space, some green space to bring our, our relatives who are, who are on their recovery journey. Right, and, and that connection to around uh, kind of the land, the work that, that Friendship House is all about, the, providing those social services, um, using traditional indigenous uh, methods also. And I think that's also key to the success of why Friendship House has been so, so successful as a model. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, sorry. Oh, I mean, uh, what you're talking about, uh, what Tyrone is referring to, people call it the Friendship House way, uh, mm -hmm. but really it goes back to the vision of Helen Wakazu, who I want to mention, you know, she, she was forcefully taken from her home, you know, as a child. Um, and and sent to a boarding school. Uh, her family used to hide her from federal agents who would come to take her. Um, but they sent her to a boarding school, and then when she turned out under the federal termination act, she was relocated here to the Bay Area, and met thousands of other natives who had been relocated here. Um, upended, you know, assured. Uh, jobs, job training, housing, and when they got here, there was, you know, there was nothing. I mean, it was that, that experience that Helen built the Friendship House, but uh, Helen also, to her credit and her vision, she started bringing in traditional medicine people who have kept ceremonies that were at one time, you know, ceremony practices that were at one time outlawed and, and, and just legalized in 1978. Um, you know, sweat lodge, you know, th things that we take today, we take for granted. But she started bringing in traditional people um, to work with relatives in recovery, and that became our program. And Helen went beyond that um, by saying, you know, the relatives who come through for help, they're not clients. They're nieces, their nephews, their aunts, their uncles, their brothers, their sisters, their relatives. And when you when you take care of someone as a relative, you do it with much more care and awareness 
but along with those relationships come responsibilities. I have a responsibility as a brother, as an uncle, as a father. Um, and we can extend that friendship house approach to the land. You know, the land is also a relative. Um, and with that relationship comes responsibility. So that is, that is the friendship house way. And I think it informs how we relate to each other as well as how we relate to the creation. And I, and I want to say, I think that's in many ways why you and, and the, the whole team has been so successful in terms of advancing the Village SF project from just a concept of like a vision, right? From Helen's vision to where you are today, where you have the line, you're, you've broken ground already and you're actually building it and you're doing it together, right? With, with different groups. And, and one thing we didn't mention, the Friendship House is located on, on Julian Street, which is in the Mission District where the American Indian Cultural District is located. But the synergy that you found kind of working with the Latino community and uh, the indigenous community here, like it's been really powerful just seeing yeah. that in action. What do you what do you attribute to that success? I mean, I I, I think that is that is the indigenous way. Um, but maybe there are there are certain obstacles that have barriers that have been removed. Um, but you're right. I think we're also at an inflection point. The the pandemic I think pushed everybody to a point where where we realized, you know, what you do matters. You know, the people who are growing the food, you know, the, the people who show up and, you know, ring up the register at the supermarket where you purchase food. You know, the, those, those folks became heroes. You know, as my sister Virginia Hedrick says, you know, where, where does your food come from? Where does your water come from? You know, who, who grows that food? You know, who drives the bus that you take to work? Um, all those things, you know, we became, I think, hyper aware of during the pandemic. And I think many of us, at least at French Cross, we were really forced to work more in collaboration. You have elders calling saying, hey, <laughs> I need groceries. You know, we, we didn't have a infrastructure to, to meet that need, but we, we kind of came out of our boxes and started working in, a, um, in collaboration to, to get food delivered. Um, to do, you know, online virtual traditional counseling because somebody's suffering from depression or isolation. Uh, we had to work together, and I think that spirit is carried forward. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I think that's such a... And I, and I want to make... We have not broke ground. We've started oh, working. Sorry. The PG&E has just put in the transformer. We're still raising funds. Tomato, tomato. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> raising funds. We have to close that capital stack. But yeah, we're anticipating breaking ground officially in the fall. Okay. Uh, tomato, tomato. <laughs> <laughs> I know there's an official name for breaking ground. So uh, we haven't officially broken ground. You're right. I want to. I want to back up because I, I think one thing. One thing uh, that's kind of a, a theme, if you will, um, in just our conversations and just everything you're saying here is is kind of this this story, right? This this kind of arc, right? Of, you know, whether it's carrying on the legacy of, of Helen, whether it's the pandemic and kind of everyone kind of coming together, coming out of their boxes, kind of working together. Mm -hmm. These are all kind of like different stories that have kind of like led you to this moment here. And one of one of your most impressive traits and, and which you have a background on it is storytelling uh, and being able to kind of like Put this all together just like you're doing for all of us today and just in a way that's very accessible and, and understandable um what do you what's the importance of storytelling to you personally right and, and we've seen it in your kind of filmmaking but like right how does storytelling play a, a role in your life wow mm -hmm. that's a question <laughs> uh but it's one I, i've contemplated and, and i, I want to share an experience that really kind of sh uh, it shed light on my own understanding of what story is and why it's important. And uh, I was, I went to my first uh, bar mitzvah and um, yeah, just got really rocked <laughs> you know, by, by what happened. And, uh, you know, the young man who I call nephew, you know, he, he got up to speak and he, you know, he started by saying, you know, like, I did not want this, man. My dad forced <laughs> me to do this. Um, but having done this scene, you know, his grandparents and his uncles and aunts, he's like, I'm so glad I'm here. And uh, as part of his training, you know, it's a coming of age ceremony, you know, into into young adulthood. 
And so as part of his training, you know, he, he had to study uh, a, an excerpt from the Torah and then share the kind of deeper meaning. And so he had uh, started with a passage from the Passover story. And, um, and he, you know, he shared some really deep insights, even questioning, you know, why, you know, God, you know, killed all the Egyptian babies, you know, aren't there good, aren't there good Egyptians or aren't there good Egyptian children? Uh, but kind of, first of all, questioning that, but then shared with everyone, and this is what got me, he said, I realized that it's the Passover story that makes us a people. And I was like, you know, like a lightning bolt went off and it, and it made me reflect on, on our origin story here in the United States. And I'm reminded of James Baldwin, you know, who said our origin story uh, really tries to convince us, you know, and what I mean origin story, you know, the, the myth of discovery, you know, oh, there's this untapped, unused land waiting to be developed. Uh, the Thanksgiving, the Plymouth Rock, you know, all the all the kind of myths that we've heard about uh, the formation of this country. But Baldwin said, you know, these the, our origin story tries to convince us that no crimes were committed, that people were not murdered, that land was not forcefully taken, and that others were enslaved. You know, um, and I think that story is coming apart at the seams right now, and we see it kind of playing out. Um, and so I feel like we're we're in need of a new story to make us a people again. Um, and so I think story has that that power. And and while it could seem very disheartening to see what's happening and the arguments going back, you know, critical race theory and you know, are you changing our history and why are you changing our origin story? Is that that people who whose voices were once marginalized or or erased? Are coming to the fore and sharing their their authentic stories and histories, and I think that's going to change and shift our story as a nation. And and so it, for me, it's also it's it's a time of possibility. Is that going to be an indigenous voice, a black voice, or some other one silence voice? Uh, so story is very powerful, and I think it I think it really pulls us together and makes us a people. As this young man shared, and one of the stories that you told was about Dolores Huerta. Uh, so I wonder if you wouldn't mind just sharing kind of what that story was in, in the film you created. Yeah, so uh, 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 Ty is referring to a film I called, uh, called Dolores. It was on the uh, iconic uh, community organizer, Dolores Huerta, who's the co-founder of the farm worker movement with Cesar Chavez. And um, it was, I, you know, I can't take credit for, <laughs> for wanting to tell that story. It was actually, it was the idea of Carlos Santana another San Francisco uh, native boy um, who called one morning and said, Peter, we, ha we have to tell her story while she's still with us. She was 86 at the time. She's 94 today and still organizing, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I was just with her in Sacramento last night. Um, but, uh, you know, she's she, her work is just so historically uh, relevant to this time and also to the history of, of, the, of the country. Um, but she had been largely erased um, and nobody really knew who, who the hell she was. Um, and so, you know, we told this story and I, I've known Dolores for, for a long time and my mom organized with Dolores, but I, I had no idea like the depth of her work and the impact of her work. Um, and uh, I was up at a, a panel yesterday at Cal EPA for Earth Week and when, uh, you know, Dolores negotiated the very first labor contract for farm workers, which everyone said it was impossible. Farm workers can never be organized into a, a labor union, but she really lives at this intersection of, of labor justice, uh, feminism, racial justice, environmental justice. And uh, when Dolores started her work, the term environmental justice did not exist. All of you here at the environmental department? Yeah. <laughs> uh, they, at that time, they were spraying toxic, poisonous chemicals on farm workers, and 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 farm workers were also children at that time, in 100 degree while they were picking, and uh, and farm workers were being born with with dirt birth defects. Uh, the Central Valley is, is populated with cancer clusters, um, and it was really the farm workers who really brought that awareness to the country that that the environment 
is not just the redwoods. It's not just saving the whales. It's also the, it's also has to do with marginalized communities who are being affected by environmental injustice, by racism. And so, uh, you know, they were the pioneers of that, the Loris and the farm worker movement. Um, and today we take that term for granted. Um, and our and our our idea of environmental justice has like brought in so much because of that work. But um, but the film kind of chronicles her life. And uh, and the film won a Peabody. <laughs> and what that means is Peabody award winning films get housed in the Library of Congress and become official parts of the historical canon. So Dolores, who was marginalized and erased, is now officially part of the historical record in the United States. So it, it, the film also changed policy. Um, so really, really proud of that. And, and now people know who Dolores Huerta is today as a result of Carlos's uh, initiating the film. Thank you for, for doing that and the amazing work. Might go even further back. I'm going to have to like main drop just a little bit. Uh, so folks didn't recognize the last name of Brat. Uh, Peter has a brother. Uh, Benjamin Bratt. I don't know if any of you have seen him. He's a, a famous actor. Uh, I used to watch him on, on Law and Order all the time when I was a kid. Uh, you wrote and directed films and, and with him uh, early on. I'm wondering if you could share kind of how that experience was. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Benjamin's my kid brother. Um, also, See, the older older one always said <laughs> kid brother. Kid brother. I got to put kid. the smack down. <laughs> Uh, he's my he's my kid brother. He's he's my uh, you know my best friend, soulmate, and 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 partner in the in the storytelling space. And you know he's also uh, an actor, an award winning actor, and also a film producer. Um, and so he and I you know kind of kind of have this sh shared commitment to um, telling these kinds of stories. And we formed a little production company. Which has been it's been put on hold since I've been doing this village work. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, yeah, he's 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 a remarkable individual, and uh, and sometimes he's my moral compass. Uh, he's an incredible father, husband, son, community member. Um, you know, I wish he was living in San Francisco. He lives on the East Coast, but uh, you know, sometimes when I am kind of at a crossroads, I I really you know. What would Benjamin do? And he, he kind of has that moral compass that really uh, grounds me. Um, but you know, he's he's a he's a San Francisco uh, favorite son, and a, a San Francisco Unified School District product also. Yeah. What school did he go to? Went to? Uh, he went to James Lick. Okay. Uh, it was middle school back then, and then he went to Lowell High School. I went to I'm, I went to McIntyre High School. I'm a Jaguar. Uh, yeah. All right, so maybe we're going to transition to kind of what do you see, what's needed for the Village Justice Project at this point to be successful? We've, we've heard kind of the work that you're doing right now. We haven't officially broken ground. Uh, there's still work to be done. We're working together on a lot of things. You're having conversations with uh, recreation and parks about the potential farm out in Golden Gate Park. How can people kind of engage in this and how can we support your work? Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, what we see uh at the friendship house is 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 what is experienced and seen in a lot of nonprofits in many communities of color not just the the native community but oftentimes uh, there's such an incredible need in the community um and you know i'm talking about frontline communities um and as a nonprofit you're just you're constantly uh short staffed and you're constantly trying to get the resources um, to build capacity to do the work. <laughs> so, you know, you're trying to build projects at the same time, you're, you're trying to build an infrastructure and, and a staff to, to do the work. And it's, it's you know, it's, it's a really, really difficult um, task. And, you know, uh, I've been doing this for four and a half years, you know, working on the ground, you know, nine to five, in this space and I'm blown away by people like Helen Wakazu and her husband Marty Wakazu who ran the Native American Health Center for 40 years You're like he ran that for 40 years she she ran French House for 50 years and I'm thinking like how the hell did you survive like the ups and downs because for every one victory there are like a thousand defeats 
Um, so it's it takes tremendous dedication and commitment. And I think it, I know for Helen was a spiritual calling, and I think for Marty it's a spiritual calling as well. And and I, I find that it has to be that if if you're going to survive. Um, but right now, like like a lot of nonprofits, you know, we need the resources, and that means that translates to funding, um, so we could hire staff, so we don't burn out uh, existing staff, and so that we could put into play um, a lot of these programs that are really they're really needed, you know, in in the city for the community, for young people, um, for for young parents, for young people who have been incarcerated. Um, and that could be completely transformative, right? Just from the space and, and again, fulfilling kind of Helen's vision around the expansion of the friendship house model and friendship way. And also the greening of the mission district, right? So it almost becomes like a, an anchor or a hub for kind of this massive transformation that can happen within yeah. that community. I mean, just like San Francisco has a, a, a remarkable uh, Chinatown, Japantown, you know, Little Italy and North Beach. It, you know, there's a vibrant, exciting uh, indigenous community here in San Francisco. And like you're saying, this can be a hub, a pole star, a destination for folks um, because, you know, the indigenous values and principles, they have so much to offer everyone, particularly at, the, at this inflection point where we're at with climate. You know, <laughs> it's all hands on deck kind of moment. And we need to we need to work together, you know, as relatives. Um, and I think Indigenous people could really could really lead that effort. But you know, Helen, I think the work for Helen goes back to when when you support a, an organization like Friendship House or so many others in our communities, you're helping hold and bring families back together. And that and that's that's desperately needed right now. All right. Well. I have my one more question for you, but I'm going to open this up to the audience first to see if the audience has any questions of you. Uh, audience, any questions online? If you want to put any questions you have in the chat, uh, we'll take those as well. Don't be shy, people. Um, you mentioned going through the treatment at Friendship House and then staying committed to the organization. You talked a little bit about commitment and I had the pleasure of visiting Friendship House and heard from other staff members also sharing that they went through the program and stayed and became staff. What is it about um, the organization that keeps folks connected and committed to the mission and wanting to um, to stay working with Friendship House? Great question. Um, I would say this this goes back to, uh, it was radical at the time. Um, it's a standard practice now in Indian country, but Helen, in, uh, starting in the early 80s, started bringing in traditional medicine people. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, there was a, a very concerted, uh, deliberate effort to um, to erase indigenous culture and assimilate indigenous people and part of that was you know in the in the land of the free were you know founded on religious freedom so many of, of uh, indigenous uh, native ceremonial practices were outlawed by this government um, and so Helen by bringing traditional medicine people we started using those traditional ceremonies and practices as our program so it's a spiritually based program. We use other, you know, Western um, uh, forms of, of healing and combine them, but that's the foundation. And so uh, the graduates who come, who, leave, who graduate the program, they, they're now on the, on the red road. They're ceremonial people. And I think when, when you reach that point, you know, you can't help but want to, you know, you've been down that road. You, you know, you become what they call the wounded healer. Um, but you have something to offer your experience. Um, and so it's, it's, it's part of their spiritual uh, growth and development. And I think that's why we see so many uh, graduates of the program leading Friendship House. Our RED, Martin Wakazu, who ran the Native Health Center for 40 years, he's a graduate of Friendship House. He came, his family came out here during the relocation from the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. 
um, but he's an example. Great question. Any other questions from the audience? A question online. Oh. Uh, this question is, um, how my indigenous approaches to caring for the land vary for people who are on the land that their ancestors occupied and for other people who, who are not, indigenous people who are not? Is that a question? Uh, maybe, can you read one more time? Yeah, so um, how my indigenous approaches to caring for the land vary for people who are uh, on the land that their ancestors occupied before them, and maybe uh, indigenous folks who were relocated and don't occupy the land that their ancestors were on, um, but live in a different part of, of the land. Right, uh, a great question, and and I think multiple answers. Um, well, I think there are like common um, values and principles that you find in indigenous culture across the board. Uh, there's also uh, widespread diversity and complexity and difference um, depending on territory. You know, we have salmon people, buffalo people, corn people, uh, longhouse people, lodge people, um, and a lot of uh, a tribe's language, cultural practice is informed by the physical, the land. Um, so I think I think you find ways to steward and practice uh, different in, in different territories. Um, in terms of uh, relocation, uh, you know, a lot of folks showed up here um, and there was a sense of dislocation. There had already been a, an assault, centuries long assault on indigenous communities prior to relocation. And then, you know, with forced boarding schools, um, you know, native people were, were forbidden to speak their language their practices were outlawed. So uh, I know from my own experience in that Friendship House, a lot of relatives who come here who are, who are uh, urban natives. Um, I know for me as a young person and people in recovery, like you're putting things back together. Um, and, and sometimes you turn to elders who, who are not maybe not from your tribe. You know, those cultural bearers who really have the, the experience and the knowledge. And, and you make do with that. Um, and again, it's intertribal here. So, so people come bringing different traditions and teachings and we, and we borrow from each other, celebrate each other, honor each other. Um, you know, I know Friendship House, one of the unique things about the village is we're working with the Yurok tribe, which is the largest in the state. And, uh, and they, uh, we're working with them to bring the Friendship House recovery model up to Northern California. You know, Indy country is being uh, ravaged and devastated by the uh, fentanyl crisis. And uh, and so inpatient services are like desperately needed. So we're working with the Iraq to do that. But up there, they've done some remarkable work in, in land stewardship. You know, I think they're the first and only tribe right now who got the state to recognize that the Klamath River is a is a being. Mm -hmm. Is a, is a holy being, it has personhood and has rights, uh, which is, it's, that's a radical move. And it's part of this new in, environmental justice movement that is indigenous led. Um, but the Yurok are kind of leading the way on that. Now other tribes are looking to follow suit. I know the Maori in New Zealand, have, they were the first to do it. Um, but it's, I think it's happening all over, parts of Africa, part through the, the indigenous world throughout the Western hemisphere. Um, but I think we can look at what's happening on the ground in communities to find those kind of innovative models. Yeah. Great. Um, and, oh, go ahead. Um, sounds like media and film production is not your main avenue these days, but I'm curious as like a consumer, like what media still inspires you or like what's on your bookshelf or? Uh, doing community work doesn't give you a lot of time to watch <laughs> movies or. Um, I mean, aside from, you know, all the, the socio-political reasons to tell stories, cultural, I just, I love movies, man. I like getting some popcorn and, you know, going to the IMAX, <laughs> drinking my Diet Coke, you know, <laughs> watching my trailers, you know, I saw Dune Part 2 and like, wow, what a ride. <laughs> so I, I just, I love movies um, and I, I love making movies and I think why I love uh, movie making is like the ultimate collaboration. Mm -hmm. You know, generations, you know, musicians, artists, costume designers, you know, writers, actors. It's just, 
it's it's just a whole a whole stew and you have to you have to collaborate that's how you create a film um no one person could do it so it's really uh it's for me it's like really intoxicating to be on a set and also to be an editorial um but uh, but there's nothing like watching a movie especially in a, in a movie house with a lot of people uh you know i'm not a big fan of like watching movies by myself on netflix <laughs> so i don't i don't really like seeing movies that way i prefer to go um, you know to to the theater by the way i have a nephew he's he's uh showing his film at the sf international film festival hey. julian brave noise cat it's called sugarcane it's playing tonight it's won the the jury award at the sundance film fest in jan great oh. Good question um so you mentioned um recognizing a lot of the leaders that helped inspire you um and also the invisibility of urban natives are there any young people uh, in the community that you want to give credit to or help them by the work that they're doing as next generation leaders? Yeah, I mean, when I, when I was a kid, the leaders that inspired me, they were in their 20s and early 30s. I think, you know, Richard Oakes, with, you know, the folks who took over Alcatraz, they were, they were, they were babies. And it, it you know, made me reflect the other day, you know, like, a lot of the leadership in, in our organizations, you know, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, and so I, I really and I think that's an indigenous um, value is there's a, there's a huge investment in mentoring and training the next generation. Like you start right away. Um, so I, I think there are really some some really brilliant uh, young leaders, thought leaders. Um, that are emerging in the community and that have really, really bold visions. I, I happen to work with a staff of really brilliant young people and mostly women <laughs> um, who, who are really, I think, at the forefront of a lot of the work that's happening. And, and I'm learning from them. I'm kind of a dinosaur uh, in many ways, especially with the tech. Um, but they're using uh, the technology in ways that kind of blow my mind. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm following them in many ways, even though I'm, I'm co-leader of the team. Um, but, you know, I'm reminded of what uh, Dolores said one time we were doing a Q&A after we screened Dolores and and the conversation was leadership and like, you know, Dolores, how did you and Caesar find leaders? And she saw oh, that's easy. You know, the leaders are the ones who show up and do the work. <laughs> and I find that to be really true. They're the ones who show up. And then, and then roll up their sleeves. All right, that was uh, our final question from the audience. Uh, we have a little bit of a tradition uh, to ask a couple of rapid fire questions. Ooh, <laughs> Tyrone. <laughs> I know, I didn't, I didn't warn you about this. Oh, oh, oh. oh. My tough question. <laughs> All right, uh, what is your favorite book or movie? Ooh, wow. Uh, my favorite, my favorite book is uh, Leslie Soko's Ceremony, mm -hmm. and uh, my favorite movie, or, or you know, just it made me want to be a filmmaker, and it was uh, Little Big Man by Arthur Penn. Would you rather bike or ride the bus? Ooh, that's a tie. Okay. <laughs> you know, hey, when I get rider's block, I get on the bus. And I want to check things out. It's allowed. Uh, <laughs> if we were to look in your black bin, what might we find? Dad, I don't think I have a black bin. One <laughs> over the entire department right now. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> oh. <laughs> Tyrone, do you have a black bin? <laughs> <laughs> I actually do. Have a black bin. But I'm not the one to interview here. Uh, if you had the opportunity to interview someone, who has passed on, who might that be? Wow. Probably Malcolm X. In the social justice movement, in the spiritual realm. Wow. That was wide open right there. Mm -hmm. so, some enlightened being though. Yeah. <laughs> if you had to choose, paperback book or ebook? A uh, paperback. Uh, would you rather have an impossible burger, a Beyond Meat burger, a portobello mushroom burger? 
a super duper burger from the <laughs> <laughs> uh, And when is Earth Day? <laughs> Wasn't it Monday? <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, any last words of advice? You were giving some advice to the young people in the space. Any last message or words of wisdom you wanna to impart to everyone that's listening and to everyone here? Yeah, I, I would just share, um, you know, I, I, I struggled in, in, uh, in, in public school in San Francisco, I was held back. And I, and I thought I was, you know, gonna be a UPS driver or I should go into the trades. And and I kind of got that message from my teachers. Um, I never in my wildest dreams thought I would be leading a community project or that I would be a screenwriter or a filmmaker. I, I, I didn't believe it and the people around my mentors didn't believe it either. Um, it was it was until my uh, later years that I met somebody who helped me believe in myself that I could really could do could do anything. Um, and so I, I see a lot of young, especially uh, native kids who come to our program already with possibilities already kind of like shut down or diminished. And, and I, you know, that the opportunities there and there, there is there's no limit. And, um, and so, you know, show up and step in and take your place, you know. Uh, that, that's my encouragement to young people, especially in our community. Our young people really need to hear that. Yeah. Thank you for that. And uh, thank you, Peter, for allowing me to have the honor of interviewing you and for allowing all of us to hear your story. Um, you're an inspiration to me and to, I know, so many folks here just based on, on your background and, and what you're doing. And we're with you, right, in terms of the work that you're doing on the Village SF project. And we're going to continue this journey together, right. which is the way it should be. So thank you, Peter. Everyone, give him a round. <laughs>